Hey everyone, greetings from Dr. Prepper. It's that time of the week again when we go back into some clinical questions and some topics for us to discuss. And be, being good at this is what's going to help you do well in your exams. So let's go get you that PG seat and let's look into today's discussion. So today's question is, which of these factors will not be affected if an individual is lacking phytonadione in his or her diet? The options being 2, 6, 9 and 10. So this question, the correct answer to this question is actually B, which is 6. So how do we arrive at this uh, answer? What is the concept behind this question? Let's look into it. So the broad topic we are going to look into uh, to help answer that question is basically hemostasis or the mechanism by which clot formation happens in our body. So hemostasis can be primary or secondary. The primary part is basically the formation of a platelet plug which happens before and this platelet plug helps in formation of the actual clot which the process of which is known as secondary hemostasis. So uh, the formation of this clot actually has two components which is the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. Uh, both of these pathways lead to a common pathway. And that common pathway, ultimately the sum of all these pathways lead to the formation of a fibrin clot. So like I said, the ultimate goal of this end of the entire pathways is converting fibrinogen to fibrin which forms the clot that we are talking about. So this entire process is assisted by many clotting factors and that is where the answer to our question lies. So let's look at clotting factors and everything around it is going to help us answer these questions. So coming to primary hemostasis, this is the process of formation of the platelet plug at a site of injury of a blood vessel. So it consists of four steps. Step 1 being vasoconstriction. Step 2 being platelet adhesion. Step, two, step 3 being platelet activation. And step 4 being platelet aggregation. So here, the most important concept associated with this that I want you guys to know is something called von Willebrand's factor. You always hear the name of von Willebrand's factor along with other clotting factors. However, it's not an actual clotting factor. It basically just um, helps in primary hemostasis. So the step between platelet adhesion and platelet activation. This is where von Willebrand factor acts. So it helps in platelet adhesion, helps in the platelets getting activated. It is usually found along the lining of the endothelial cells. So if these are the endothelial cells which are there along the blood vessel, this is the vessel showing flow, the von Willebrand factor is found along these walls. So any area of injury that might cause this to be exposed the von Willebrand factor is what causes the, plate, the platelets in the blood to get adhered. So, it's very important for von Willebrand factor to be functioning well for platelet adhesion and platelet activation. And any deficiency or any problem in the von Willebrand factor causes a problem in this primary hemostasis and formation of the platelet plug. And that is what forms von Willebrand's disease. So you have to remember that von Willebrand's disease actually does not happen due to a deficiency of any clotting factor. It's because of the deficiency of the von Willebrand's factor. So now let's look at secondary hemostasis. So this is the whole of secondary hemostasis or formation of a stable fibrin clot that I want to talk about. But it looks really complicated, doesn't it? So let's try to break it down and make it simpler as it is one of my favorite things to do. So, just a brief overview here, this here is the intrinsic pathway, this here is the extrinsic pathway and this is the common pathway which leads to the formation of our ultimate goal as I mentioned right at the beginning, a stable fibrin clot. So, let's break it down and look at all of them one by one. So, let's look at the clotting factors. These factors are uh, multiple uh, compounds that play a vital role in the various steps of the coagulation cascade is what the process is called. So let's look at the factors. First factor is fibrinogen as it is the most ultimate important factor which gets converted into fibrin which forms the meshwork for the clot to be actually formed. Then there's prothrombin, there is thromboplastin which is the third factor. 
there are calcium ions calcium if you ever get a question saying which of these is the most uh, important uh, non protein component of the coagulation pathway then calcium ions will probably be the most important answer because it plays a role in various steps of the coagulation cascade there is factor 5 which is pro accelerin factor 6 which is accelerin remember that factor 6 is not actually described everywhere so if anyone says that which of these following factors is actually not it does not exist or is not described remember that factor 6 some places give it as accelerin some places just refuse to acknowledge a factor 6 so remember that that factor 6 actually might not exist next we have factor 7 which is bioconvertin factor 8 which is anti hemophilic factor a factor 9 which is anti hemophilic factor b or christmas factor factor 10 which is stuart prover factor factor 11 which is plasma thromboplastin antecedent or anti hemophilic factor c there is factor 12 which is the hegman factor and factor 13 which is the fibrin stabilizing factor also known as the lucky loren factor so you can have multiple questions from these factors but just remember these factors in their inactivated forms roam around in the blood as zymogens and when activated they become serine proteases so as you can see with the name proteases there are actually enzymes which can also contribute to activation of other factors so remember there are zymogens they are mostly proteins so remember that so you will also notice that in these uh, factors i have highlighted factor 2 7 9 and 10 so why i have highlighted these are these are the factors which are called vitamin k dependent factors we will soon learn why this is so but so if you get a question where you have uh, any question like deficiency of vitamin k will affect which of these clotting factors remember 2 7 9 and 10 these are the factors so the question that we looked at earlier about phytonadione that's actually phytonadione is the chemical term for vitamin k so that question basically wants you to tell which of these factors is actually not a vitamin k dependent factor and that's how we came to the answer of factor 6 because as we have now learned that the vitamin k dependent factors are 2 7 9 and 10 which are highlighted in this slide so now that we know that let's start looking at the coagulation pathways so let's look at the intrinsic pathway of clotting once initiated it basically causes activation of factor 12 to factor 12a So now if you look at it all these solid boxes with the small a next to them that represents an activated factor. So factor 12 is uh, converted into active factor 12a. Um that converts factor 11 into factor 11a. That with the help of calcium ions converts factor 9 into factor 9a. Um thrombin helps conversion supports the conversion of factor 8 into factor 8a. This combines with factor 9a and with the help of more calcium ions goes into the common pathway which we will look at later so that sums up the intrinsic pathway so now the key points of intrinsic pathway that i want you to take away let's look at those so the salient features of the intrinsic pathway that i want you guys to remember is that it is a longer pathway as you saw there were multiple steps multiple factors involved uh, the initiating event is exposed endothelial collagen when there is internal injury in the blood vessel these are the endothelial cells so when this endothelial collagen gets exposed to uh these clotting factors which lie in the blood that activates factor 12 and that leads to initiation of the intrinsic pathway it is measured as partial thromboplastin time or ptt some places is also known as aptt or activated partial thromboplastin time so remember aptt measures the intrinsic pathway it is the longer pathway happens due to exposed endothelial collagen now let's take a look at the extrinsic pathway So let's focus on the lower half of this slide which shows us the extrinsic pathway very small very cute very only two factors are involved factor 3 and factor 7 so damage to endothelial tissue causes uh, activation of factor 3 to factor 3a uh, this is as you know tissue factor or also known as tissue thromboplastin so this thromboplastin gets activated into factor 3a um factor 7 gets activated into factor 7a and these two combine with calcium ions to enter the common pathway so only two factors are involved 3 and 7 um and these lead to the common pathway so now let's look at the salient features of the extrinsic pathway i want you guys to know. so the salient features of the extrinsic pathway are uh, that it is a shorter pathway as you remember the intrinsic pathway was longer 
It is activated by tissue factor released by the damaged endothelial cells after some external damage. So as we know, again, this blood vessel, these are the endothelial cells which line the blood vessel. So any external damage causes them to release tissue factor, which was factor 3. And this gets activated and starts the whole cascade of the extrinsic pathway. But as you know, there's only two steps, two small factors. Therefore, it's a shorter pathway. It is measured as prothrombin time or PT. So remember when they ask for PT, APTT for any individual, it's because they're looking to assess both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways. PT measures the extrinsic pathway and APTT measures the intrinsic pathway. That's very important to know and remember. Now that we have looked at both the pathways, let's look at the common pathway. So this is the common pathway, a diagrammatic flowchart of uh, the common pathway. So as you can see, this blue and these red arrows are actually representative of the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway. Both of them uh, start off the common pathway by activating factor 10 into factor 10A, as you can see. So if you may get a question saying, what is the first step of the common pathway or what is the common junction of uh, the common pathway or what is the junction at which the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways combine the answer to all these questions is the activation of factor 10 to factor 10a you should remember that so factor 10a combines with calcium thrombin is activating factor 5 into factor 5a combines with calcium to activate uh, thrombin which was factor 2 into the activated form this finally helps in conversion of factor 1 which was fibrinogen to factor 1a which is stable fibrin so as we uh, recall in the second slide we had mentioned that the ultimate goal of the coagulation cascade is to convert fibrinogen into fibrin so this fibrin is what is responsible for the mesh work but as you can see factor 13 comes later so what does factor 13 do as you remember it was known as fibrin stabilizing factor so once activated by thrombin into factor 13a it combines with the fibrin and calcium to form a stable mesh work which is finally responsible for the clot formation so now that you know this is the common pathway so you might ask me one thing as to why thrombin which gets activated here you've seen it already in multiple steps previously in other steps so thrombin is responsible for positive feedback of the coagulation cascade thrombin once produced in its active form of factor 2a keeps uh, helping in activating these factors further factor 5 factor 13 and previously we also saw some other factors were being helped into activation by thrombin. So thrombin causes positive feedback of this coagulation cascade, helping to activate more and more factors and pushing this pathway forwards so that more and more of fibrin can be produced and more the clot can be formed, which is stronger. So now we have understood what the entire coagulation cascade pathway is. Couple of salient features of the common pathway. As I said, it starts by activating factor 10 into factor 10A. It is the junction of the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways so it's activated by a complex called 10 is which is easier to remember factor 10 factor 10 cleaved by 10 is very easy to remember factor this 10 is has an intrinsic and extrinsic components but usually i don't think you get a question from this so just remember this activation of factor 10a is done by a complex called 10 is so any pathway of the body requires some form of feedback to regulate it because any process that goes about unregulated will cause problems. So we already discussed the positive feedback of the uh, co coagulation cascade by thrombin. Thrombin is also responsible for negative feedback mechanism of the co coagulation cascade because if you don't regulate clotting, we, you can have widespread thrombosis. All your blood vessels can get coagulated and that is not a good thing as you can as you know. So thrombin, what it does, it activates plasminogen to form plasmin, which stimulates the production of antithrombin. Now what does antithrombin do? It goes on to inactivate thrombin itself and factor 10A, which is the initiating point of the common pathway. So antithrombin is what uh, inactivates thrombin itself and factor 10A. There are also other, uh, other proteins like protein C and protein S, which inactivate factor 5 and factor 8. So all these things in combination help in decreasing coagulation and regulating the coagulation cascade pathway. So very important to know negative feedback of the coagulation pathway is done by antithrombin, protein C and protein S. Very important to remember. So now that we know about all these uh, clotting factors, the coagulation pathway, some common coagulation disorders can easily be understood. So the most common coagulation disorder that you must have heard of would be hemophilia. Hemophilia has three types, hemophilia A, B and C, which is respective deficiencies of three clotting factors 
uh, individually. Hemophilia A is deficiency of factor 8. Hemophilia B is deficiency of factor 9. And hemophilia C is deficiency of factor 11. So another question that they ask from this commonly is the inheritance. So hemophilia A and B are X-linked recessive, recessive inheritance. So hemophilia is also a very common uh, example of X-linked inheritance. Uh, hemophilia C, which is the deficiency of factor 11, is actually an autosomal recessive inheritance. So that is another difference between the two types. Very easy to remember because just a simple deficiency of factors. Von Willebrand's disease, as I previously already explained, is the deficiency or the formation of a faulty von Willebrand's factor. This causes problems in the primary hemostasis and is actually not responsible for the coagulation part but the platelet plug formation part. And vitamin K deficiency, as we have known, which also helped us answer our question, is a deficiency which will affect factors 2, 7, 9 and 10. Therefore, since all of these play an important role in the coagulation pathway, definitely will cause disorders of coagulation. So that brings us to the last part of this topic for now, which is TEG. TEG is what stands for thromboelastograph. It is basically a new investigation that is being done very commonly for people uh, to assess their bleeding and coagulation times. Uh, what the TEG holds as an advantage over doing a standard coagulation profile is that it can also assess platelet function, clot strength and fibrinolysis. These features are not offered by doing a standard coagulation profile. So as you can see, this is what a TEG plot looks like. Uh, what I want you to know or remember from this is only that the, this is a plot of amplitude against time. So amplitude is plotted against time of a sample a blood sample mixed with normal uh, serum sample that we know mixed with a patient's blood sample. So first half is for coagulation and the second half is for fibrinolysis till this point. So multiple parameters of the, these are measured like R time LY30 which is basically uh, an MA. MA is basically the maximum amplitude that is achieved at the end of coagulation. R time is the time after which coagulation is initiated. LY30 is basically the value is the amplitude 30 minutes after maximum coagulation has been achieved. You might not get a question from these values as such, but you should know what a TEG stands for, why it's better than uh, the other coagulation profile and what the graph is representative of. It is the plotting of amplitude against time. So TEG is something new which has not been questioned yet but may be questioned very soon. So that's all I have for today's discussion. I hope you guys like the video, share it so that other aspirants like you can also benefit and subscribe to the channel if you want to continue seeing such videos and such content. If you want me to cover any specific topics, please let me know in the comment section below. Alright, so keep up the good work and all the best for your need.